OK, uh, good afternoon. So we are almost to the end of the day. Hopefully, we'll try to keep you awake with security. because Security is fun and exciting. And we have activities to keep you. So I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, almost two. And I've learned that activities that keep hands busy are, are good for everybody, keeps everybody happy. So uh, we have some GitHub repos that you can look at. Uh, my GitHub username is trombone hero. So if you go to trombone hero slash sandbox hyphen examples, um, we're going to look at some of those things. And we're also, well, uh, this is as good a place as any to look at FreeBSD source code. And let's hope the hotel Wi-Fi can stand up to all of us working together. OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, some moves that we have been making in FreeBSD towards the direction of what I'm calling oblivious sandboxing, meaning applications running in sandboxes confined protecting or users being protected from malicious applications or applications that become malicious when they get exposed to bad data um, without those applications having to know anything about capsicum or about uh, security things at all. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, that's not very good. Let's try this again. Ah, oh, bother. OK, fine. We'll do it this way. And come out of presenter mode. There we go. OK, so first of all, we will talk about uh, Capsicum. So Capsicum is a framework that exists in FreeBSD for what I'm calling principled and coherent compartmentalization. So compartmentalization, you take an application in which every line of code is equally trusted and it had all better perform it, uh, up to spec or else you're completely stuffed. Um, and we want to break that application into pieces so that we can have, we can reason about what will happen if certain bits of this application get compromised. Will the private key leak? Will user data leak? Uh, will the attacker have the ability to blat stuff on the file system? Or will the attacker have the ability to blat stuff anywhere on the file system? These are very different, and it would be nice if we could reason about the differences among them. Um, so we're dividing applications, and the reason that I'm saying that Capsicum is principled is that it goes back to this history of operating system security work that's been done since the 1960s all the way through to now. Good ideas are not just from the present. Sometimes people in the past had some good ideas too. Some not so good ones as well, but some good ideas. Um, and there is a principle at the core of Capsicum, which we'll come back to, which is about the monotonic reduction of authority. So you can always put yourself in a state where you're allowed to do less, and you can't put yourself in a state where you are allowed to do more than you were before. And this turns out to be a really important principle. Uh, so it's principled, but it's also coherent. It provides you with clear and simple policies in contrast to some other approaches that we're going to see. Um, however, these are policies that are, well, they're coherent. They make sense across multiple applications, um, and they are applied uniformly. So not tweakable and customizable like some other things we'll talk about in a moment, like sec comp and pledge. But we think that is for the best because these are, well, it is a policy, really, that has been designed to make sense and provide you with security properties that you would like to have. Um, OK, so Capsicum has two main components that we need to talk about. And all this is kind of background to where we're going. But first, we need to know what Capsicum is. There are two main things we need to know about Capsicum. One uh, is capability mode. And the second thing is capabilities. OK, so what is capability mode? Capability is a mode is a mode that a process can enter in which its access to global namespaces is removed. So you are no longer allowed to do anything that requires accessing a name in a global namespace, such as the file system, or, su well, uh, uh, sorry, such as the root file system, such as the PID namespace, such as uh, certain syscontrol uh, MIBs and all kinds of things. There are lots and lots of namespaces in Unix systems, and we are removing all access to global namespaces, which means that two separate processes that are both in capability mode do not have the ability to talk about the same object in a global namespace. So they can't even name the same objects. Uh, it's Hotel California. You can go into capability mode. You can never leave. If you exec, then your, uh, the new process is also still in capability mode. If you fork, then the child process is also in capability mode. So one way only. And this provides a very, very strong form of isolation. But this is only half of the story. Um, now, there are other ways 
of limiting what system calls you can perform and providing some degree of isolation on other platforms. And people keep asking, so well, let's talk about them. So for example, who's heard of SecComp? OK. Who's heard of Capsicum? OK. All right, that's good. All right, so the marketing has been working, I guess. Um, yeah, so SecComp is a mechanism that exists on Linux for attack surface reduction is the current, current terminology. SecComp by itself is no longer claimed to be sufficient for implementing a sandbox. You also need to have C groups, and you need to have PID namespaces and virtual network namespaces and, uh, all, and cheroots and other things. Uh, but SecComp is part of the story. It is a way of restricting what system calls can be performed by an application. So you know, we said no access to global namespaces. This means things like the open system call are no longer available in Capsicum. Well, SecComp is another way of turning off the open system call, or in fact, of giving yourself a whitelist of system calls that an application is allowed to perform to try and provide some of this isolation. I don't have my presenter mode anymore, so we'll see how this works. Um, so you can filter the system calls that you're allowed to perform using Berkeley <laughs> BPF programs. Uh, we'll ignore what the P stands for in the middle. Uh, and this makes it really easy to do things like test is the system call that I'm attempting or that is attempting to be performed, um, is this system call one that is allowed by system call number? If it's system call number 72, I could declare that yes, this call number 72 is fine. So I can build a little BPF program. I can install that in the kernel and say for this process, only allow things to happen that are accepted by this little BPF program. Now, it's on the same architecture, because of course on Linux, different architectures have different syscall numbers, and so it gets really complicated if you want to do uh, you know, cross-compilation and things, but okay. Uh, it's actually quite hard to test things like arguments, um, and I'm gonna argue that it is impossible to test system call arguments in a meaningful or coherent fashion that actually implements any kind of security policy, just like SysTrace. People introduced SysTrace and said, it's a great new security feature. Shame about the fact that it didn't work. Ah, okay, fine, now it's a debugging feature and now it's being removed. I think it's even been removed from OpenBSD. Uh, but in just the same way, SecComp is not able to meaningly provide checks against argument values. And this is what this kind of looks like. So you're gonna define a SecComp program using uh, BPF macros that have been defined. Um, and yeah, I got a lot of this from, uh, with help from somebody who knows a bit more about BPF. Uh, but here's an example of how we can build a BPF program. And here we have some more macros that we've defined, BPF jump, BPF jump plus BPF uh, jump equal plus BPF K, and then checking a system call number. If that's the same, then you're going to allow something. So this is all a BPF program to test. Are we on the architecture I think we're on? If so, uh, let's allow break and close and something else and something else and something else and open at. Otherwise, we can fail, we can kill, we can trap. Okay. Also, there's another uh, BSD that has a mechanism for filtering system calls, and this is pledge. So this does not look like a lot of fun to write. And, well, it wasn't a lot of fun to write, even to adapt from what somebody else had written. Um, so pledge allows you to do the same thing, but in a much simpler way. So there are, are some categories of system calls that have been prepared for you. Um, and you can say, from now on, this process promises or pledges that it's only going to use system calls that are in this category, standard I.O., things like open, or not, sorry, not open, read, write, close, clock, get res is part of I.O., but okay. Um, and, you know, re cause read only side effects on the file system, or cause side effects on this file system that involve creating files, or things like that. So you can filter out, cert you can create again a whitelist of allowed system calls that this process is allowed to perform. Okay, uh, and optionally, you can have this path whitelisting thing. So I'm gonna argue that just like SysTrace, that just like SecComp, actually pledge is still insufficient for doing meaningful or for implementing meaningful security policies. The argument is that pledge is really, really easy to use, and that's true. It is really e easy to use, but it's a shame that it doesn't actually buy you the things that maybe it thinks you buy, it buys. Maybe the things you think it buys. So with pledge and setcomp, there is some good news, right? If you have a trivial application, then you can sandbox it, 
trivially. So that's quite nice, right? Uh, if you only need access to read, write, close, and exit, um, then, well, either installing a seccomp, well, putting your process into seccomp strict mode, where you don't even have to provide a filter, you just, you know, it restricts you to uh, these guys and exit. Okay, that's really easy. Um, and in the same thing is true for pledge. If you're only going to use things from this, well, actually, there's an expanded list of system calls, um, then you can say, dear kernel, I pledge to only use standard I.O. Uh, system calls from now on. Okay, so that's very good. Um, and we can do this kind of thing with pledge and with seccomp and with capsicum. And in all of them, it looks quite similar. Now, this is a FreeBSD notebook, so I'm not going to run the pledge demo or the seccomp demo, but I can show you uh, the capsicum demo in which we are going to have... So we have a program called excite.c, which is going to take strings and it's going to make them more exciting. Um, this involves a library called libexcite, which again is going to just make things more exciting. Um, and so you can see we're doing some capsicum -y stuff. Let's not worry about that limit standard I.O. for the moment, but we're calling this cap enter system call, which takes our process, puts it into capability mode. Once you're in capability mode, you can never leave. Okay, so very good. And then uh, we call this excite file function, which is part of our lib excite. And in lib excite, you can see that excite file, uh, it reads from a file descriptor that's already open. Um, and then it rewrites the contents of a buffer by saying, well, let's make those more exciting. Um, and then we write to another file descriptor that's already open. Okay, so that's all very exciting. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, so, and let's run this program. And you'll notice that this very, very trivial program that takes an already open file descriptor, does some computation, and writes to an already open file descriptor. This is the same behavior basically on pledge and seccomp and capsicum. They all do the same thing. It all just works. I can say hi, and it gives me a more exciting version of that string that says, yep, yeah, hi. Uh, and maybe, is that a bit more readable? Yeah, OK, good. Uh, and I can say, what's up? And it'll say, what's up? Ooh, what's up is what's up. That, that's kind of profound. Maybe we can ask it, is this a Turing test? And say, yes, this is a Turing test. Ooh, OK. All right, but that's a whole other talk. Um, so that is our very, very simple and trivial demo of a very simple and trivial kind of program. Um, however, very, very few applications are quite that trivial. So if we have a slightly more interesting program, which in this case um, is called, well, it's going to depend on some open at functionality. So in this case, our do stuff program, shrink that ever so slightly. Um, it's going to parse a configuration file, and then it's going to interpret that configuration file. And we're not going to go any further than that. Um, and is often the case in practical systems, a configuration file is <clears throat> sometimes actually an imperative program. Uh, so here you can say we can print something, we can include another file from the same configure, um, we can print something else. I wonder what's in that other file. Well, maybe something from a package installed something like this. Um, so we're going to create a lock file called foo.lock. So we're going to say, dear program, now we're going to interpret this configuration file. Use this scratch directory to store whatever stuff you need to store. Uh, so we can allow or we can lock the, or create this foo.lock file. And then we can create this file called ooh, dot, dot, slash pwned. Hmm. Ah, that's going to be interesting. Also, incidentally, um, if we had time to look at the header, or in fact, if you're looking at the header file in front of you, you notice we have space to store 16 byte strings to print, and that's more than 16 bytes. So this is another motivator for why this security stuff is kind of important, because now uh, some attacker, because they installed some arbitrary config file somewhere that they tricked you into reading, uh, now they've got your process doing whatever they like. So we would quite like to confine this process. Um, and you're going to see. If I try to run this program here with Capsicum, um, we, uh, there's a bunch of ktrace stuff there, but that's just to make it easy to debug. Oh, we, uh, well, when we come back to capabilities, I'll explain that stuff. Um, but you will see that when we tried to open dot dot slash this pwned file, uh, we weren't allowed to do that. Okay, very good. If on the other hand, 
we look at what happens when we run the same thing under pledge or under seccomp if we allow the open at system call and we say, dear process, uh, please run with this configuration directory uh, and please run with your scratch space being something that I just made with make temp dot dot slash pwned. So actually we're able to write stuff outside of the scratch space that was assigned. Um, and so if we try to have any program that's more complicated than just a bunch of existing files, a bunch of existing file descriptors, and straight I.O. from one to the other, we get into real trouble when we use systems like pledge and seccomp. Um, so you might say, now pledge allows you to have a white list of paths, so surely that would solve the problem. Well, no, actually. So first of all, it requires you to enumerate all the paths that you might ever want to open, which is slightly problematic. Secondly, the filtering is shallow. It works on file names. It doesn't work on, say, symlinks. So if I try to open a directory that is called foo, but that foo is actually symlink to dot dot slash dot dot slash something, now there's no filtering there. And finally, and this is the real nail in the coffin, this is kind of what killed uh, systrace, is that you have time of check to time of use problems. So in the presence of concurrency, you cannot rely on system call wrappers, on filters that are done at the top of the kernel when the, providing policy authorization at the top of the kernel when the actual operations are being performed down in the kernel under a whole different set of locks and things. If those operations are not atomic, you do not have security. Okay, so uh, it is not enough to filter on system call names and numbers. It's not enough to filter on system call arguments. You must do authorization atomically with the operations that are being authorized, which means by necessity it has to be done in the kernel, at the place where, for example, names are turned into V nodes when they're looked up under those sets of locks. That is the only time when it is safe to check policy. Is a certain operation allowed? So this is a limitation for SysTrace, or it was. It is also a limitation for seccomp with BPF. Pure seccomp mode, which only uses read, write, close, and exit, yeah, that, that's fine, because that's, but again, you can only write very trivial applications with that. Um, when the Chrome developers tried to use the original seccomp in their sandboxing model, they ended up having to write thousands and thousands of lines of, of security critical support code, code to forward system calls from one process into the other, a lot of it involving handcrafted assembly in the name of getting the security right. Um, however, this is the same problem with pledge. You either fail open and you don't know it, or you cause such restrictions that you have to jump through the kinds of hoops that I talked about a moment ago. Right, so capability mode is part of Capsicum, but it is not enough to have a viable sandboxing policy. The other thing that you have to understand is capabilities. So historically, starting in like the 60s, uh, a capability was an identifier for an object and a set of operations that you could perform on that object, broadly defined. Um, so Dennis and Van Horn talked about it being an in an index into a supervisor maintained capability list or C list and you might be twigging that sounds kind of familiar that sounds like something that I know as a Unix person and indeed that's because capabilities and influence PSOS and PSOS influence Multics and Multics influence Unix and what do we have in Unix that kind of sounds like a set of identifiers for an object operations that can be performed on them in a supervisor maintained list for a process that sound at all familiar? File descriptors, yes. So file descriptors are a bit like capabilities. File descriptors provide you with an index into a supervisor maintained list of objects. Uh, there are operations that can be performed on these objects and there are some limitations that are in place. Um, however, along the way when we went from capabilities to PSOS to Multics to Unix, along the way in the name of pragmatism, which is generally a good thing, uh, something was lost, and what was lost was the, uh, the rigorous focus on being able to restrict and limit the operations that can be performed on files. Um, so file descriptors carry lots of implicit rights. You may not be allowed to read from this file, but you can chone it or chmod it or something. Um, so that, that's not quite 
the model that we are hoping for in terms of uh, restricting the operations that are going to be performed. If I have an untrusted sandbox process that's being exposed to, you know, uh, it's doing MPEG decoding or something, and that's the kind of thing that goes wrong all the time, you know. Uh, the Chrome developers found, I think, a thousand vulnerabilities in FFmpeg in the first N days that they started using it and fuzzing it properly and stuff, where N is a hundred maybe, I forget. Um, if you're going to sandbox that kind of computation, then it would be a shame if when you pass a file in read-only, it's allowed to chmod it and do ioctals and do all kinds of weird stuff, right? Um, so there's a lack of this monotonic reduction. You can't take a file descriptor and then say, here's another file descriptor that's exactly like this one, except now you're allowed to do one less thing with it, or, you're allowed, or you, it's been restricted in some specific ways. So that's where capabilities come back. Capabilities in Capsicum provide a rigorous focus on the things you're allowed to do with a file descriptor. So a capability is a file descriptor, uh, but it's a file descriptor that we have limited in additional ways. So every file descriptor in FreeBSD these days um, carries with it, so there is a pointer to a struct file, you know, C, poor man's polymorphism, um, but there's also a structure that represents some capabilities associated with that file. Now please don't confuse these with POSIX1E capabilities or even, uh, what was it, Symbian capabilities or something. Uh, those are actually privileges. Capabilities are things that pertain to objects, not to like the global system as a whole. The name clash is unfortunate, but well, this name was using it first, so there we go. Um, so we can say what you're allowed to do with a file descriptor with a set of uh, somewhat orthogonal capabilities. So you can read from this thing with the read system call, or the p read system call, or the read v system call, or various things. You may need read, you may need read and seek. Um, there is F truncate or cap M, uh, M map or F chmod or F stat or there are all the different operations you might want to be able to perform on most file descriptors. We can explicitly say this is allowed or this is not allowed. Uh, where it's not focused on what is the name of the system call, it is focused on what is the operation that you're actually trying to perform. If you perform a system call that implies a bunch of actions are going to be taken that are effectively the same thing as some other system call, such as I want to enqueue a bunch of asynchronous I.O. for later, well, if that asynchronous I.O. is writing to some files, then you better have cap read and, and instead of having a cap A.I.O. or something like that. It's about what operations are actually being performed rather than the spelling of the system call. Um, so. We can, uh, and what happens is at the point in the FreeBSD kernel where you take a file descriptor number and turn it into one of these uh, struct file desk ends, and you try, or actually to the struct file, where you try to say what file corresponds to this file descriptor number for this process, when you have acquired all those locks, and at that point, a policy decision can be taken, which is, in order to perform the operation we're about to do, you need to have, so in the sys fstat uh, you know, call tree, you would need cap fstat, because you're getting statistics about the file. Um, and so if this capability has kept cap fstat, then this will succeed. If it doesn't, then it won't. And so at the point where we do this resolution, this translation, that is the point where we make our policy evaluation. Um, and then, how do we derive things? If you just use regular open from a process that's not in capability mode where it's allowed, then your file descriptor just has all the writes. Um, and from then on, you can limit writes with cap writes limit. You can say, OK, we're going to restrict this file descriptor a bit, or I'm going to dupe it. I'm going to create one for my children. I'm going to dupe it, and then I'm going to restrict this one, and I'll hand the restricted version off to my children or my worker processes. Um, and then if you use open at or accept at or some other at system calls, then the, the rights that you get on the new thing depend on the rights from the old thing. Okay. Um, and so applying capsicum in practice looks a little bit like this. For those who are at BSD CAN, you might notice a little bit of the joke that we have there. Ha, ha, ha. Um, however, in a more practical situation, not lib true, um, in, this is code from Beehive. This is the code that was required to run a hypervisor in a sandbox. That's, that's quite simple. Isn't that very nice? Um, so we had to say, let us apply, and I said we would come back to this, let us apply some Capsicum limitations to standard out, 
and standard air. So you can uh, read from standard in. You can't ioctal on the terminal, for example. That, that's the sort of thing that might be nice to ensure. Um, and we're going to enter a capability mode. OK, so there's all of our background. That's Capscom, Capscom as she is played, as it were, today. But notice that this requires that an application decide, for the goodness of all, I am going to give up certain uh, rights that I have. I'm going to voluntarily limit myself, because I know I'm about to do some stuff. I'm about to encounter some untrustworthy data. Uh, I'm about to read some stuff that I saw on the internet, and that's always a bad idea. So first, I'm going to compartmentalize myself. I'm going to limit myself. And then I'm going to do the thing that could cause me to turn into a bad actor, uh, to be compromised and turn into a malicious process. But in the long run, what we want to do is to have compartmentalization of applications without having to modify them. Now, this is not a lot of code, but if you want to apply that to all of the binaries in the ports tree, well, that's a lot of work. If you want to sell every application vendor on using Capsicum when they want to be as portable as they can, that's a lot of work. So where we want to get is compartmentalization without changing the binaries. Um, and this also allows us to have mandatory Sandboxing. I'm going to run this program in a sandbox whether it likes it or not. OK, so as we do things today. Um, so the first step in an application that wants to do this voluntary self-compartmentalization thing, uh, typically you will open some kind of resources. So uh, here we are in a shell. We fork. We exec. The runtime linker does some magic. It grabs some libraries. We run main. In main, we're going to open maybe a working directory. Um, and then we can call cap enter, and we can enter into a sandbox, and then we can do some computation, and OK, life is good, right? So profit, hooray. Um, what kinds of resources are we talking about here? We are talking about resources that either you can enumerate them statically, so we know in advance what they're going to be. This thing isn't going to run without access to libc.so.7. Uh, or they could be resources that, in some cases, are externally provided. You connect to something, say, please give me a file descriptor for this thing that I need. All right. Um, so we have explicit resources that we depend on. And those are things like files and directories and sockets. But there are also some implicit resources. Uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> The explicit resources, to fix that, we can pre-open some of these things. Um, so when you open a file descriptor and then you fork and exec, well, open file descriptors are preserved across that transition, unless they're open with close on exec. Um, so you can fork. You can open a bunch of directory descriptors, for example. Here's your configuration directory. Here's your working directory. Here's some scratch directory. And in those, you can use open at to your, to your heart's content. We won't allow you to dot dot out of those working directories. And we can be confident that that works because of where the authorization decisions are made. Um, but we can do all this. Then we can set ends to tell the child process about where it can find all this stuff. And then we can cap enter, right? Um, and we can get some things from external services like a power box service or something else. But in addition to these explicit dependencies, explicit resources that we need, there are also some implicit resources that we typically don't think about when we're writing C code. Um, so there is locale data. This is a little bit annoying, right? So this stuff needs to be pre-cached by calling into libc functions that go out and fetch locale data and then bring uh, and then cache it. And then maybe it's safe to enter in a sandbox, because otherwise we won't know how to print numbers correctly. Um, that's, so lots of magic happens there in libc. Uh, there are also lots of shared library. The simplest things you can imagine on a BSD system still need libc in order to run. Um, however, neither exec nor runtime linking, at least previously, before we did some of this work, neither of these things worked in capability mode. So uh, traditionally, you'd fork a process, you'd exec a binary which is going to blow away all of your virtual memory mappings and things, does some clone and close on exec. Um, but it's going to keep other files open, and it's going to preserve environment variables. It's going to find the binary by name if you use the exec system call. It's going to mmap that binary into place, and it's going to transfer control to the linker. All right, so problematic. What is problematic about this line? Hint, it's the highlighted portion. What's problematic about the fact that we're finding the binary by name? 
Yeah, global namespace. In order to get at that binary, we're going to have to go out to some kind of global namespace like the file system and say, please go get me user lib bin ZSH or whatever. Uh, user local bin ZSH. So the first problem is we're going to find that binary by name. Um, now, one solution that we might say, oh, but we have this handy fexecve thing. Um, and that takes a file descriptor you've already opened for the binary. And so we can fexecve that. Um, later, if you like, ask me how fexecve works on Linux. It's hilarious. Um, but we don't have time for it right now. Um, but the other problem is that we're going to mmap some stuff. Right? We're going to mmap the binary. Well, if we have the file descriptor, that seems easy. Uh, and but hang on, is an mmap allowed in capability mode? Here's a file descriptor. Please make this file descriptor available in my virtual address space. Yeah, of course that should be allowed. Uh, but what are we actually mapping? So um, there are a couple of different things that are going on here. Um, when we exec a binary, whether we're using exec, execve, fexecve, all these things end up in this uh, this current execve function, which is called do execve. Um, and that is going to try out a bunch of different image activators, depending on what kind of image this is. Is this an elf binary, an a.out binary? Is it a shell script? Um, so we're going to try each of these ones in turn. Um, and then eventually, we get down into some kind of a function, like if this is an elf binary, some kind of a function called <clears throat> under under concat exec under elf n imgact something, something, something. Uh, who uses C tags? Wow, not many people. Who uses C scope? Who uses grep to find functions? Yeah, yeah. If you're looking for under under elf 64 load or imgact, good luck with that in here. Um, there should be a moral to that story, but there are no morals where elf is concerned. All right, um, but the way that that particular function that actually runs uh, works is the elf image activator says, well, here's a binary that you want to run. I know how to interpret an elf binary. Um, well, I know how to find the runtime linker, which in elf parlance is the runtime interpreter. Um, the binaries actually encode a runtime linker path. They say, please exec me with slash libexec slash ld elf dot so dot one etc. Uh, through a field in the program header table. And then the elf image activator is the thing that's going to take the interpreter and it's going to take the binary. It's going to map them both into a process. So what's the problem? I'm an academic and I teach. So what's the problem class? Everything. <laughs> Everything is the problem. OK, fine. The linker here is always specified by a path, which relies on going out to a global namespace which is not allowed if the process that we are servicing is in capability mode. Ah. Now, you could think, well, wouldn't you find ways in which, by policy, you could maybe allow that sometimes, as long as the name matches certain things, uh, because you're in the kernel and something, something, something. Well, you could, but then we start losing this principled approach to security that gives us confidence that the thing actually works. We start opening ourselves up to all kinds of weird esoteric things, like people substituting runtime linkers. OK, so how can we find the linker in capability mode? Uh, fundamentally, all name lookups in global namespaces are restricted in capability mode. And in the file system, it's in this weird function called name i, which is in VFS lookup, um, which if we're in capability mode or if there are certain other conditions, then we set a flag that we are performing strictly relative lookups. You can do open at relative to this directory. You can open things inside of that directory, but you cannot dot dot outside of that directory. Um, this is a desirable property of the way that we're doing confinement in Capsicum because it allows us to have confidence that the stuff actually works and gives us a coherent security policy. So uh, what can we do instead? We can't look up the default RTLD path. We can't say, well, this is an elf binary, so I guess we'll go look at libexec blah, blah, blah. Uh, we can't use the path specified by PT and Terp. So where can we get a runtime linker? Uh, and the answer is ever so cheekily, well, <laughs> let's punt on that one. Uh, by which I actually mean, um, dear user, why don't you tell me which linker it is that you want me to use? OK, thanks, bye. Um, so when an application launches a, an obliviously sandboxed binary, the thing that does the launching, which will be some kind of a shell, 
the thing that does the launching is going to have to know something about ABIs because it's going to be responsible for stitching together some services that would normally be just provided transparently by relying on access to global namespaces and the fact that names sometimes mean the things we think they mean. Uh, so instead, the thing that launches applications is going to have to have some kind of knowledge of, well, this is an ELF binary. I guess I'm going to need the ELF runtime linker. Um, so maybe this can be incorporated in a library. Dear bin utils, what kind of binary is this and what sort of linker should I be using for it? Maybe it's a system service that is provided. Dear Casper, uh, what linker should be, or go get me the linker that is appropriate for this binary. Um, and we leave that to future work. Um, but initially, we thought, well, let's have a new system call that allows you to specify, here's the linker I want you to use, and here is the binary that I want you to execute. Um, but in the end, we settle on another approach, which is just to have a linker that can be executed and can have a binary passed to it explicitly. Uh, so Constantine did some work. In fact, it was mostly there. Recently, our um, runtime linker was almost to the point where you could execute it with like a main function. It could just run. Um, and so he did a little bit more work, and now it can actually just run. So you can execute uh, ldelf.so.1. It will tell you here's some options you can pass. And then something we added for capsicum use for sandboxing is you can explicitly say the thing that I want you to execute, DRRTLD, instead of a program that's already been mmapped for you by the kernel instead of a binary that you can look up by path is take this file descriptor that I've already opened for you. File descriptor 4 contains a binary, map that and run it. Okay, so as before, we fork, open some directory descriptors, we, we tell the child process about them through set env and we call cap enter. Um, but the new bit is that what we actually do is directly execute the linker. And we say, and here are some arguments, plus we're going to tell you about what the binary is. Now, obviously, there's not really C syntax, but I hope it conveys the point. Um, and this stuff exists now. So you can do this in FreeBSD, which is very exciting. Uh, I'm not going to run this demo because well, we're running short on time. Um, but the question is, so we have this little program, which you know, um, actually is not in that sandbox examples. The earlier sandbox examples were there, but I will throw this into the sandbox examples your uh, repo I gave you earlier. A program called run, which is in some sense the opposite of sudo. <laughs> Instead of running this as root or as another user, we're going to run this as me, but with less privilege. We're going to run it in a sandbox, and the binary won't have to know anything about this sandboxing stuff. It will just be sandboxed from inception. So now what run does is it finds an ELF interpreter, finds a runtime linker, finds a binary, and then it executes them inside of a sandbox. So that fixes everything, right? Uh -huh. No, probably not. No, not quite. All right. Um, remember, applications need <coughs> libraries in most cases. And the runtime linker, although it is uh, subtle and quick to anger, it is still, in some sense, just code, right? And it's code that's running inside of the applications, running inside of the process. It's not external to it, which means it's subject to the same restrictions as any other bit of code that's running inside of your process. And that's a property that you really, really want. Um, so uh, we can't open libraries. So um, because linking can happen at any time, after, on startup of the program, later on we can decide actually now we need to do some more linking or we need to go find some plugins or whatever. Um, but our libraries cannot be opened from capability mode. Uh, we have to find them somewhere else. So normally, there's a set of rules for how you go find libraries. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's how we go find libraries in RTLD. Um, followed by open. So we, the result of this would be get me a path to a library that I can open that meets my needs or that has the right name. Um, so what we've had to do instead is to say, well, in addition to this, so one of the options here is LD library path. You can specify outside of the normal places you look for libraries, also look in this path for libraries. We now have a, an environment variable uh, which is LD library path FDs. So let me give you, please, or here are some directory descriptors of directories that contain libraries. And you can do open at inside of those, or access at, or stat at. You can go look for libraries that you're looking for inside of the directory represented by file descriptor 4, 5, 6, 7, et cetera. Um, and then you can open at and do all the things you need to do. 
So good. So we can run RTLD. RTLD can find its libraries. RTLD can run binaries now. Um, and this is quite exciting. So do we have profit yet? Well, again, uh, not quite. So um, now we have a little bit of profit. And I will take just a moment to show you this. Uh, So this is the program that I mentioned, which I am, oh, right. OK, so here is the run program. And now we can do exciting things like run bin echo hello world. <laughs> do, 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 do. Well, the reason for that is because we have not set LD library path FDs. Now, fortunately, I happen to have stashed that in Git earlier. Um, so if we set LD library path FDs uh, and we have something that will open our library directories for us before we call cap enter, then hooray, we can run echo. Yay, so that's some degree of profit, right? OK. Um, so we can run echo, but of course libraries are not enough. Most programs want to have access to some other kinds of resources. So we also need to provide some support for that more traditional notion of resource access. So we want to use things like existing applications, a lot of things are not written to use access at and fstat at and open at. They use access and stat and open. None of these things are allowed because they rely on, they only work in the presence of global namespaces. So we could rewrite all of our applications instead, uh, but that wouldn't be a very oblivious way of handling things. So uh, this is where libpreopen comes in. And this is code that is not yet in the FreeBSD tree, uh, but the goal is to get this or something like it or something inspired by it in before 12. Um, so libpreopen provides a structure which maps names to file descriptors with certain rights and flags associated with them which can be directory descriptors, and it provides wrappers to provide Capsicum aware versions of things that would normally use global namespaces. So uh, for instance, our version of open says, well, you've given me a path. If I preload uh, libpreopen, uh, libpreopen's wrappers, our version of open will say, I'll take that path, and I will look in this map that I have and see, do I have any directories that correspond to some of that name? If so, well, I can convert that into an open ad. I'll say, oh, I've already pre-opened user home john uh, foo.conf or whatever. I've already pre-opened that. So I can use that as a directory descriptor and then convert that into an open at call. So if things have been explicitly delegated, then OK. Uh, so we pre-open that. And on success, we translate long names like this into things like file descriptor 3 and foo.conf. OK. Uh, and if there is no pre-open path, if you have not been explicitly given access to that directory or file or what have you, then OK, well, we just fall back to the normal route. That's, that's not allowed. You, you can't access that because nobody's given it to you. Um, so I think I started slightly a minute behind. But on the other hand, we're getting kind of late. So um, here is our goal. Our goal is to have a shell. Well. So it may not be a fully featured shell, but kind of a library that you can link into other shells, which understands all of this stuff for the purpose of executing unmodified applications in sandboxes from inception so that you can run even complex applications like uh, a goal is to be able to run things like a compiler from a sandbox so that it can access things that we specify in a policy file. OK, it can get access to user local LVM 3.9 bin, user bin. Uh, it needs to be able to access things like user lib, clang, something, something, something. It needs to be able to access those things. We specify those explicitly, pass them in in a read-only way. But now we can execute our compiler or some other complex program that deals with complex data, uh, programs that are easily crashed by exposure to untrusted data. And now we don't have, and uh, now we can run them and know exactly what the side effects will be if something goes wrong. We'll know how limited the damage can be. Um, so that is the goal of where we're going to have a 
if not a, a shell as you think of it, because I don't want to write shell syntax rules and things, um, but to have tools that can be incorporated into shells and shell-like programs that execute other things so that we can run applications without them having to know anything about compartmentalization and to run them in sandboxes from inception. 